Eastern Shepherd, it would not be all that difficult to separate sheep from goats. I mean, you would think at the end of the day or at the end of the week or at the end of the month and certainly before the time of shearing that you would need to separate the herds and the flocks that have been mixed together on the side of the hill and you need to separate the sheep from the goats. And no matter how much experience or how much inexperience you have, it wouldn't seem to be that difficult to separate the sheep from the goats. I mean, the sheep are fluffy and the goats have stringy hair. They make different sounds. Their heads are different. The legs of the sheep are of one shape, the legs of a goat are another shape. It just seems like it wouldn't be that difficult to separate the sheep from the goats. And then there's that issue of temperament. You know, everybody has a story about how hard goats are to take care of. You know, the old story. If you take three goats and put them in a barrel, seal them in a barrel for a month, what do you have when you open it? Well, one of them has died, one of them's run off, and the other one's had twins. <laughs> That's what it is when you have goats. On the western island of Inishmore, off the coast of Ireland, they have an unusual tradition and inheritance. When the patriarch dies, no matter how many children are in the family, they divide the land among the children. And they divide the land by taking the black rocks, the dark rocks out of the soil and piling it and making fences. And consequently, the island is covered with small plots of land that are fenced with rock. And when I say small, some of them there is the size of this stage right here that have been fenced off by rock two and a half or three feet tall. And there were goats grazing in these small fences. And someone in the group said, how do you keep the goats from jumping over the fence? And the tour guide said, well, you take the front leg of one goat and tie a rope around it and tie that rope to the back leg of another goat and that way they'll never be able to jump the fence. He said they will never work together to get over the fence. Well, sure enough, as you're going through the island, if you pay close attention, there's all these goats in the field and then there's all these ropes tied between the goats, keeping them in their place. And the other side of the coin is that sheep are, sheep are more docile, but they're not any easier. Everybody's got stories about sheep that couldn't defend themselves, sheep that won't drink out of running water, sheep that are so dumb that if they're caught in a heavy rain, some of them will drown because of the water running out of the wool and over their face. And they can't shake the rain out of their, their wool. Goats and sheep are hard animals. And yet, when you get them together, you can tell them apart without much trouble. Now, our parable in Matthew chapter 25 speaks of separating the sheep and from the goats and is something that every Middle Eastern shepherd would know very well. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, and then he will sit on the throne of his glory and all the nations will be gathered before him and he will separate people one from another as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he'll put the sheep on his right hand and the goats on his left. And the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you at a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, 
Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. And then he'll say to those on his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me. Naked and you did not give me clothing. Sick and in prison and you did not visit me. And then they will also answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick in prison and did not take care of you? And then he will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did not do it to the one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. When the Son of Man comes in all his glory, he's going to separate the sheep from the goats, the parable says. And once again, it seems rather simple. Those who are, saw the Son of Man and met his needs, those are the sheep. And those who saw the Son of Man and did not meet his needs, those, those are the goats. It really boils down to six things. Food, water, clothing, friendly, medicine, visitation. Six things that can separate the sheep from the goats. And the sheep says, Lord, when did we see you in any of these conditions? And he said, when you saw the least of these, my brethren, you saw. You saw me. And you did it. You fed me. You gave me water to drink. You clothed me. You were friendly to me. You gave me medicine. You visited me. And the goats, on the other hand, saw the very same circumstances and did nothing of the kind. So it seems rather easy to separate the sheep from the goats. So I thought this morning, let's try it. Let's separate the sheep from the goats in our town. I thought I'd get Quentin to come up here. He could organize us into scavenger hunt teams. We'd take 10 minutes. We'd spread out across the town looking for sheep and looking for goats and then come back and give a report. Then I thought better of it. I thought it's after 11. As soon as we separate into, into the scavenger hunt, some of you will go to Leo's looking for somebody to call a sheep and a goat and you won't come back and give a report. So we're not going to scavenger hunt. But that's how easy it is. Our friend Joel Gregory told me one time, Never has a health and prosperity preacher been more properly named than Creflo Dollar. Creflo Dollar is a, is a health and prosperity preacher in Atlanta, Texas. If you listen to Creflo, he will tell you, Jesus died so you can have a Rolex. And if you'll be faithful and give money, Jesus will give you a Rolex. Well, a couple of weeks ago, while on the ground in an airport somewhere in the world, somebody ran into Creflo's jet and ruined his jet. And so he's decided he needs a new jet airplane. But he doesn't just want any jet airplane. He wants a Gulfstream 650, which is the biggest, fastest business jet in the world. It costs $65 million. He has five in the bank. He needs 200,000 people to give $300 a piece so he can buy a Gulfstream 650. And he needs this. Because this new plane will fly from Los Angeles to London 30 minutes quicker than the old plane would. He can go from New York to Tokyo in an hour quicker than he could in the old plane. He needs this. Desperately needs this plane. That's Creflo. You can give if you choose to. Consider Michelle, who lives in Charlotte, North Carolina. She is in line at the Starbucks one morning. She ordered coffee through the speaker. She opens her purse and realizes that her wallet is sitting on the table at home. She's got no money. And there is a curb along the edge of the drive through which in, prevents her from escaping after she's made her order. 
So she's working on her excuses. I'm sorry, but I left my money at home. And then she's going to kind of play it off to the cashier. You can give it to me and trust me till tomorrow, or you can keep it. She pulls up to the window, and the cashier leans out the window and says, the car in front of you has paid for your coffee this morning. So Michelle says, now when I leave home and I drive through the Starbucks line, I do two things. I check my purse before I leave, and I pay for the coffee and the person behind me. So Creflo or Michelle, sheep or goats. See how easy it is? See how easy it is to look into someone's life and say, they've done these things. Food, water, clothing, friendly, medicine, visitation. That's all that's required. And I wonder if we couldn't take this passage of Scripture here and maybe use it as a, well, a game plan for life, if you will. We're going to do these six things, and then maybe perhaps that will guarantee that God will love us and let us in at the last days. Perhaps if we do these six things and we take care of the people, then maybe one of the people that we're taking care of will be Jesus himself, and he'll automatically say, hey, y'all come on in. You know, we do that with Jesus' words. We take Jesus' teachings and we turn around and we craft them into a strategy for success. For example, the first shall be last, and the last shall be first. So when it comes time to be at the potluck dinner, we all stand around at the end of the line, making sure that everybody else goes first. Say, I'm last. That makes me first. You folks were first. That makes y'all last. The Lord's got to love me more. <laughs> or he says at the banquet, he says, don't go into the banquet hall and automatically go up and sit at the head table like you belong there. He said, go sit at the back of the room and if the host calls you forward to sit at the table, then rejoice that you've been called forward. Because the last shall be first, and the first shall be last. So before, instead of listening to Jesus' teachings and how to craft that into a lifestyle, we turn it into a strategy for success, and we say to ourselves, if I can be last, then that makes me first. That makes me in front of all these other people who think they're humble, but I'm humble because I'm for last. You see how we do that? So may we take these six things that Jesus list. Food, water, clothing, friendly, medicine, visitation. Maybe I could take those and craft those into a strategy to make sure that God loves me. Is that what Jesus is saying here? Notice that. In both cases... The sheep and the goats. Goats, the sheep are not so bright, the goats are cantankerous. Neither one recognized the need. Neither one said, when did, they both said, when did we see you and we didn't meet your need? When did we see you thirsty? When did we see you hungry? When did we see you naked? When did we see you in prison? When did we see you sick? Every time, sheep or goats never see that it was Jesus. But the sheep because they have been chained somehow on their own and by the power of God, but they have been changed. They meet the need without even knowing it. It's part of who they are. And the goats, on the other hand, have never had an encounter with Christ and never had an encounter with God, and they're just like, they're just like we've always been. They don't see the need, and they don't see what's going on around them, and they just do their own thing. These have had an encounter with God and their lives have been changed and these have not had an encounter with God and their lives have not been changed. It's not a strategy for success. It's a description of those who've had an encounter with God. And yes, it is easy to tell. Two weeks ago, 
on a Monday night. Actually, tomorrow will be three weeks. I was on the internet looking to see if there happened to be a video of one of Fred Craddock's sermons that I wanted to show to my students as an illustration. And there was the Google headline, Fred Craddock dies. I read the paragraph below. He had been buried that afternoon in Cherry Log, Georgia. No one influenced preaching over the last 40 years more than Fred Craddock. No one. He had this ability, this ability to take various areas of philosophy and communication theory and weave those together with presenting the gospel. It was unlike any one of our time. And he retired a few years ago from teaching in Atlanta, and he and his wife, Nettie, they drove around and they, they built a house up in northern Georgia, up in the mountains. He said there's a little creek running through, and they built the house on one side with a little walkway over the creek and then his study on the other side. He said, I would tell you where it is, but I don't have time to fool with you, Stacy. But they built this house up there in, in Georgia, and he said, we live in the place where the mountains of Georgia, Tennessee, and North Carolina get together for coffee every morning. He said, we moved up there to get away. Now, when you read Fred Craddock's stories or you read his sermons, you find that he grew up in the Depression with an alcoholic father. And he is shaped by that experience. He tells the humiliating experience of having a Sunday school class in their own church adopt them for Christmas and having to stand there quiet as the ladies in the Sunday school class argue over which pair of used shoes fit Fred the best. He tells stories of being evicted. He tells stories of his sister's social isolation because of their poverty. He tells stories about medical needs that go unmet. And you can tell his whole life has been shaped by poverty and alcoholism. But when they moved to northern Georgia to get away from it all and to hide from preachers, he said they started noticing there was a whole lot of children up there that grew up, were growing up, just like he grew up. Children who, who didn't have shoes on their feet in the Appalachian winter. Children who didn't have toboggans on their head, didn't have gloves on their hands, didn't have coats on their backs. Children who went to school barefoot and in shorts in December. He told Nettie, he said, we can't, we can't live like this up here. So they opened the Craddock Center. Opened it about 12 years ago. And in the goal of inviting in all the children of Appalachia, and Fred's been very insistent over these years, they get new shoes, new clothes, new coats, new toboggans. They are fed, they are clothed, they are welcomed, they are visited, and they are cared for. And I, I don't know, I didn't... We sat across the dinner table one night and he told us about these poor kids and how they were, what they were trying to accomplish. And I never got the impression that he was trying to craft a strategy for getting into the kingdom, but, but he lined up with Matthew 25 very well. And Fred knew the Bible. 
When Fred wanted to go to college, they were so poor, he couldn't, go to, he couldn't pay tuition anywhere. He heard about Johnson College in Tennessee. It's near Chattanooga. Johnson College, some of the students work in the early mornings on the farm, and then they have class during the day. And then some of the students have class during the day, and then they work after class on the farm. But you work on the farm to pay for your schooling at this Bible college. And Johnson's Bible College is very rigorous. When you graduate from Johnson's Bible College, you are able to stand before your professors and quote the New Testament book, chapter, and verse. Matthew through Revelation. When you stand and graduate from Johnson Bible College, you stand before your group of professors and they call out Matthew chapter 25, verse 31, and off you better go. And then they call something else out and something else out and something else out until they have got a sense that you have the whole New Testament memorized. Fred knew the New Testament. But as we sat across the dinner table one night and he was just sharing these stories about these Appalachian children, he kept saying one thing that I think tipped us off as to the sheep or the goats. Whether he was a do-gooder or whether he was serving God, he kept saying, in the name of Christ, In the name of Christ, we, we offer them new shoes. And in the name of Christ, we feed them. We take care of them. In the name of Christ, we make sure that every kid has a new toboggan every winter. In the name of Christ... Maybe that's how you separate the sheep from the goats in the name of Christ. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, every one of us has stood in this place of judgment in our own lives. We've stood before a person in need and we didn't know how to respond. And other times, Father, we've stood before a person in need and your Spirit spoke to us and we knew exactly what to do. Father, I thank you that among the fellowship and the members of this congregation, your spirit has been prompting and leading for generations. To give food and water and clothes and to be friendly and to offer medicine and visitation. Father, I pray that as we step through life, that your spirit would speak to us in such a way that whenever the needy come before us, we recognize the need and we are able to respond in your kindness and in your compassion. And Lord, help us to resist the temptation to just go on our way and to say it's too much trouble. Father, help us. By your Spirit, help us to be the sheep that change the world. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our hymn of invitation today is Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Spirit speaking to you today to accept Christ as Savior. You come accepting him as Savior and he will change your life. If you're here today looking for a church home, come and join with us. If you're here today 
seeking ministry and you'd like to have a word of prayer, you come forward. Whatever the need of your heart, let's respond today. Let's stand and sing together.